All right, welcome everyone to lecture 32 for the semester. Now for the remaining three lectures, so 32, 33, and 34, um, we're going to not complete a whole lecture on each day of class because there's there, these lectures, if you, if you looked at the notes here, they're kind of long and also the material is kind of a, a bit dense. So like, for example, we're not gonna finish all of lesson 32 today. We're gonna go to about like page nine and then we're going to quit there, and then we'll do the rest of it and 33 on um, Monday. So we're going to kind of be partitioning up these last few lessons here. And that being said, um, I mean, I always encourage you guys to pay attention normally in class. Like, you'd, you'd be kind of wasting your time if you weren't paying attention and you were here. Um, but I, I want you guys to pay special attention to these next lectures because it's, it's, it's a bit hard to digest. So I want you guys to pay special attention uh, right here. How's the lecture quiz going to work? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I'll have to look at that after class, but I'll, I'll, I'll make an announcement about that. Yeah, so don't, don't worry. All right. So anyways, let's go ahead and get started here. So last time we learned how to parameterize surfaces, kind of like how we parameterize curves back in Calculus 2 and the beginning of this class. Um, so what we're going to do now is we were able to generalize ordinary integrals into line integrals that look like this. And remember the, the sort of picture going on was that we were able to take our area under a curve from calc one, and we were able to extend it to 3D space where the domain, unlike the domain being a straight line, like in calc one, the domain could be a curve right here. So rather than measuring the area under a straight line, we're measuring the area under some kind of curved line. Or I, I called it a curtain, I believe. Um, so this was our transition from an ordinary integral into a line integral right here. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take this generalization and bump it up a dimension. So earlier in the semester, we learned about double integrals, right? So a double integral, the most basic interpretation of that is if we have some kind of surface here, let's say maybe it looks like this, then what we do is we can find the area under this surface by doing the double integral. So this would be the double integral of f of x, y, uh, dA. Now the thing about this and what it has in common with this right here is the domain or the x values of this were constrained to be in this line, right? In the same way, the X and Y values in the domain, so this is the domain D, all of them are in the X, Y plane. So D is contained in the X, Y plane. In mathematics, this is the symbol for contained. You write a little C and then you put a line under it. So our domain for double integrals live in the X, Y plane. Now, kind of like how we were able to expand our domain from just being a straight line to being a curved line here, what we're going to do is we're going to um, expand our domain here to be any kind of surface, even one that's not in the x y plane. So what we're going to do when we transition from an ordinary double integral into what's called a surface integral, our domain now can be any kind of surface. We can imagine this as a surface S floating up here, and then we could have some kind of function to find on that. And we could find out the, the volume or whatever this quantity is right here. So kind of like we're no longer restricted to just being on an axis right here, we're no longer restricted to just being on the X, Y plane as we were for double integrals right here. All right, so let's go ahead and go over formally what this is going to mean right here. Um, so here's the Riemann sum for what we're doing. What we do is we break our surface into these tiny little pieces or chunks. This is gonna be our delta S i j. And we look at the value of the function with a point picked somewhere in this little box. And we calculate what the area of the surface is times the height right here. So we kind of make things that look like this. And this was similar to how we did double integrals way back when. We kind of have these little uh, strips of volume right here. Now, last time we have found a specific formula for the area of our surface or little pieces of our surface. Remember, these were kind of like little scales or mini planes. That's what I referred to them as last time. The formula for those, the area of those, is the magnitude of RU cross RV 
and then we have delta u delta v. So remember what r u and r v were. So if we have r of u v is a function for x, a function for y, and a function for z, then r sub u would be all of the u derivatives of these. And you could probably surmise what um, r sub v would be, which is going to be all the v derivatives of these. And remember, the, the, the key thing here is that these formed a normal vector, and the size of this normal vector, or the magnitude, has to do with um, the surface area of our plane. What's pij? pij is a point in delta sij. So somewhere in this box, we pick a reference point, and then that's how we plug that into our function, and that's how high we go up. Kind of like when we did Riemann sums, we picked either the left or right side to make the height of our rectangle. So we're kind of doing that choice right here. All right, so then if we, we sum all this together, so we have the function value times ds, which is written in an expanded form right here, then we can rewrite our surface integral. And this is, by the way, this is the scalar surface integral, kind of like how we had um, uh, scalar line integrals. We're going to start with scalar surface integral here. Uh, this is going to be D. And then we have F of X of UV, Y of UV, and Z of UV. And then we have RU cross RV. DA, where this D with this domain here, this is the space of U's and V's. So whatever the range of values for U and V are, that's going to be in this domain. Can I define delta S again? Yeah, delta S is the area of one little chunk of the surface here. So the entire surface is S, and then delta SIJ would be like one little rectangle on the surface right here. Uh, what's the difference between this lecture and the last? This is, you can almost imagine this as a continuation of last lecture. So what we're doing is now that we know how to parameterize surfaces, what we're doing is we're doing integrals over them with this parameterization. All right. Okay, so let f be a continuous real function on the surface s. And we have a parameterization for the surface, R of UV is X, Y, and Z, with those being functions of UV. And U and V live in the domain V. All right. Now assume that the tangent vectors are continuous on D and that the normal vector, remember RU cross RV forms a normal vector, is non-zero. Then the surface integral is going to be um, what I pretty much wrote on the last page. So it's going to be F of R of U and V so this is me plugging in this X, Y, and Z function into my F right here. And then I multiply by R, U cross R, V, D, A. Now, another way you'll see this written, in fact, I actually think I've seen it written the second way a bit more often, is you'll have F of R, U, V times the magnitude of a normal vector right here. Because remember, that's all this is. This, this just forms a normal vector, right? So we can just substitute in our normal vector right there. That's what n is going to be. Because remember, this formed a normal vector. All right, so this is our surface integral. So we have our function, which you can imagine is like our height, and then our, our base area, or ds. Remember, all of this is ds right here. This is the area of one little chunk of our surface. Why lowercase sign? Um, I don't know. It, it, it just means normal vector. Yeah, I think in the last lesson they use uppercase sign for some reason. Yeah, I'm not sure. There's, there's no significance to that. All right. What's the difference between this integral and the normal double integral over 3D space? The main difference is that the double integrals before our domain was in X and Y here. And we could do stuff like turn this into polar coordinates or whatever. We, we were still confined to integrating over something in the XY plane. Now what we're doing is our domain can be any surface, even one that's not in the XY plane. And the analogy here is that with ordinary integrals in Calc 1, we were just confined to have our domain be this line here. But in Calc 3, now we can kind of twist that line up right here. 
All right. So let's take a look at some notes here. So there's a few properties of the surface integral. Um, so kind of like you'd expect, remember that the double integral of one represented the area of your domain. So kind of like that, if we replace our f of x, y, z is one, then we're just doing the surface integral ds. And we saw last time, this is literally what we did last time, this is the surface area of s. If you ever want to find the surface area, you just integrate one ds. But I emphasize this is one ds, meaning you're still going to have your ru cross rv right here. All right. And then also last time, um, suppose we do have a surface that's defined as a function k of x, y. And the reason why we're using k is because it's a letter that's different from x. So suppose z is a function of x and y, kind of the way we like to see surfaces defined, kind of the nicest way. Um, then remember, we calculated what rx cross ry was. It's the square root of the x derivative of this squared plus the y derivative of this squared and then plus one. So if we want to do this surface integral right here, then we're going to do this over our domain D. And this time, X and Y are going to be in D. And we're going to do F of X, Y. And then Z, we could write as a function of X and Y. So this is our function part. And then DS is going to be RX cross RY DA right here. So we have the square root of kx squared plus ky squared plus one dA right here. So if we do happen to be fortunate enough to have our surface written as z as a function of x and y, then we could write our surface integrals right like this right here. So this is kind of a specific case of the more general version up here. Why is x, y, and d? Technically, x and y are the parameters for our surface. R of X and Y is X for X, of course, Y for Y, that makes sense. And then instead of Z, we have K of X, Y. So kind of like how our U and V were our parameters here and they lived in D, then X and Y are our parameters here and now they live in D right here. All right, well, that's enough theory here. Why don't we go ahead and actually compute one of these and get our hands dirty on this. Okay, so we're going to calculate the scalar surface integral, uh, the integral of x plus y squared ds, uh, where what's our surface here? Our s is the cylinder x squared plus y squared equals one from z is zero to z is three right here. So what you could do is you could sort of imagine this as a function that's kind of hovering above or outside of the cylinder. And it's almost like we're building up like kind of a collar of volume around our cylinder. That's what this is computing right here, be the volume of that. So like, here's our cylinder. And then I don't know exactly what this function would look like, but we can kind of imagine that this function is like sort of hovering outside of our cylinder here. And we're sort of computing the volume of this kind of um, tube right here. That's kind of what we're doing. Although honestly, the visualization kind of gets a little bad here with the surface integrals. It's, it's a, they're higher dimensional, so it's a bit harder to imagine. All right, well, mechanically, how would we end up doing this? Well, first of all, we need to find a parameterization of the surface that we're integrating over. So our domain or our surface S is this cylinder right here, right? So the cylinder has the equation X squared plus Y squared equals one. And then Z goes between zero and three here. All right, so what I'm gonna do, I think we actually parameterized this very cylinder before, or I think it went up to five or something, but I'm gonna use two variables. I'm not five, five is not a variable. <laughs> I'm gonna use uh, theta and Z right here. Um, so let's get some practice. Um, what do you think my parameterization is gonna be if I have variables theta and Z? and I have this equation, and then I just have z. What do you guys think? Cosine theta, sine theta, and z. Yeah, you guys are on it. That's, that's absolutely right. You have cosine theta, sine theta, and z right here. So this is gonna be our parameterization of this surface. So we can get to any point on the surface by 
using the coordinate theta, which just tells you how much we spun around, and then Z, which tells us how high we go. All right, now in order to do the surface integral, let's review what the formula for that was, which is back here. Um, we have um, our function with the parameterization plugged in, and then we have the magnitude of R U cross R V. So why don't we figure this out first? Let's see what R theta is. That's our first variable. Let's see the derivative of this with respect to theta. That's a negative sine of theta. The derivative of this with respect to theta is cosine of theta. And the derivative of this with respect to theta is zero. All right, let's do the even easier derivative, R sub Z right here. Well, let's see, there are no Zs here. So the Z derivative is zero. Uh, same with the Y coordinate. And then the Z derivative of Z is one. Okay, so we have some relatively simple R thetas and R Zs right here. You wanna use five as a variable? Yeah, everyone would hate that. It'd be too confusing. Yeah, num numbers are off limits for, for variables. Um, so let's go ahead and figure out what the cross product is. We have our i, j, and k. We have negative sine of theta, cosine theta zero, and then zero, zero, one. All right, let's see what the, the x coordinate is. So we do the, the minor, this determinant right here. So we have cosine theta times one minus zero times zero. So that's cosine of theta. And then we have j right here. So it's negative sine times one minus zero times zero, but then j has an extra negative sign by default. So this ends up being positive sine of theta. And then finally with k, we have negative sine times zero minus cosine times zero. That's just a big old zero. Okay, so this is our r theta cross r z right here. Now, when we're doing the, the scalar surface integral right here, uh, we wanna find the magnitude of this. Okay, so let's remember how to find the magnitude of a vector. Hopefully I haven't forgotten that. So we square this, and then we add this squared, and then we add this squared all under a square root. And conveniently, we have cosine squared plus sine squared is one, one plus zero is one, square root of one is one. So conveniently, we have a really nice uh, R cross theta right here. Okay, remember that was just one piece of the puzzle though. So we figured out what this is, we're good there, but now we need to substitute in our parameterization for the function. So our function um, f of x, y, z is x plus y squared. Now our x component, every time we see that we have cosine, every time we see a y we have sine, and every time we see a z, we can just leave it as z. So this means that our double integral well, we have x, which is cosine, and then we have y squared, which is sine squared right here. And then normally we would multiply by, by this, but that's just a one. And then we're doing this with d theta dz right here. Now they tell us what our bounds for um, z are. So z goes from zero to three, uh, they don't specify what our bounds for theta should be, uh, but I think it's pretty clear. If we wanna be able to go all the way around the cylinder right here, it should be zero to two pi. All right, so this is what our surface integral became. So kind of like how I gave the analogy back with line integrals that when we convert the base surface in, or the convert the base line integral into a calc one integral, we're effectively going from here to here. So when we take this surface integral written like this and we convert it into just an ordinary double integral written like this, we're effectively taking this situation and turning it into this situation right here. Because we don't necessarily know how to deal with this, but we definitely know how to deal with this from earlier in the class. So when we do this conversion, when we do all this work here, we're effectively turning this into a double integral that we can do. How do we find the original R vector? This is a parameterization of the cylinder here. So I see an x squared plus y squared equals one. That lets me think that maybe x should be cosine, y should be sine. That's a good way to parameterize a circle. And then z could just be anything from zero to three. So that's where I got uh, this right here. 
Uh, does this concept extend to triple integrals? Uh, we'll get to that later. All right. So thankfully, this double integral actually isn't too hard to do. Uh, we can rate write this as the integral from zero to three dz times the integral from zero to two pi of cosine of theta. And then I'm gonna have to integrate a sine squared, right? So do you guys remember what to do when we need to integrate a sine squared? Half angle, that's right. So we're gonna use the half angle formula for sine squared which is one half minus one half cosine of two theta. All right, so we do the integral of one dz and get z, and we just plug in three minus zero, that's three. All right, the integral of cosine will be sine, the integral of one half will be one half theta, and then the integral of cosine of two theta will be sine of two theta over Four, because we were already dividing by two, and then we divide by another two. That goes from zero to two pi. All right, so let's go ahead and plug in our numbers here. So we plug in two pi in for sine, sine of two pi is zero. Plug two pi in here, we just get a pi. Plug two pi in here, sine of four pi is zero. And then plugging zero in for any of these will get zero. So we end up with three pi right here. So this is going to be uh, the value of our surface integral right here. All right, so what does this answer represent? Um, we're going to see specific applications of this later. Um, you can imagine this as like the signed volume that this function generates on top of this surface. The best way I could describe it is this picture right here. So this is kind of, this is this like kind of squiggly thing is the f of x, y, z. And then this s here, the surface, this is our new domain. This is gonna be the cylinder right here. Now I say sine because potentially f could be negative. Kind of like how way back in the beginning, uh, this isn't the only way to think of a double integral because f could be negative there. So this is technically a signed volume. This would be a signed volume as well, right here. All right, but again, the, the intuition for, like the physical intuition for this starts to fade as we get to higher dimensions because it's a little bit harder to, to visualize here. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's very astute. Yeah, so someone asked if RU cross RV is kind of like a Jacobian. And the answer is yes. You can think of it as like a Jacobian uh, between, let's see here. You can think of it almost as a Jacobian between D right here, this place in the XY plane and the surface S right here. So yeah, that's kind of a good way of thinking about it. All right, is the squiggly thing in four dimensions? No, it's only in three dimensions. Yeah, you could think of this as kind of puffing off of the, the edge of the cylinder here. All right. I usually don't like to encourage this, but um, for now, I want you guys to just think of, just focus on doing the computation right now. Um, yeah, fo focus on doing this for now. When we get to our last lesson, we're going to summarize all of this stuff and it'll all tie together then, but we need to learn how to actually compute these things too. So don't worry too much about the interpretation right now, just kind of focus on computing it for the moment and then we'll interpret it later. Oh, I feel disgusting just saying that, but like that's that's really how we should do. That's really how we should do this here for now. All right, evaluate the surface integral y squared plus two y z ds, where s is the first octant portion of the plane two x plus y plus two z is six. All right, now unlike last time, which we didn't have a z as part of our formula, then um. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> I, I I didn't I didn't mean anything bad by that. Yeah, we it's it it really is kind of hard to visualize these things here. Um, but we will have a satisfactory explanation coming. I promise you. All right. So for this one, uh, we're going to solve for z right here. So I'm going to subtract two x and y over. Right here. And then I'm going to divide by two. 
So I divide by two and I have three minus X minus Y over two right here. All right, so I actually am able to parameterize this. I'm able to write Z as a function of X and Y. So this allows me to use, um, where did I write it? Oh, I wrote it on this one. So this allows me to use this specific formula for the surface integral right here. So this is my RU cross RV right here. And then I just plug in X, Y, and then my function for Z in for F here. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. So we're doing this over our domain D, which X and Y live in there. Um, we have Y squared, which we're going to keep the same because we keep the Y variable the same. And then we have two Y times Z. Now we're not gonna write Z as Z this time. We're gonna write Z as this three minus X uh, minus Y over two right here. Okay, so that's the F of X, Y, K of X, Y part. So this is the F part. And then the next part would be our RU cross RV part right here. So we need to know what KX and KY are. So if we do the X derivative for our function of Z, what do we get? We have negative one. And if we do the Y derivative of our function of Z, we have negative one half. All right, so that means that the square root of ZX squared plus ZY squared, and then we have an extra one, is the square root of negative one squared, so that's one, plus negative one half squared, so that's one fourth, uh, plus one over here, so this is the square root of nine fourths or three halves. All right, so once again, we have a relatively nice uh, RU cross RV or normal vector here. So we're just going to put our three halves here at the end, and then we have this as DA. All right, so let's clean this up a little bit, and then we'll figure out how to do our double integral. Actually, we should probably draw a picture of this. Let's draw, let's draw a picture of this plane right here. Okay, so if I make, for example, y and z be zero, I get the two x equals six or x equals three right here. All right, and then if I plug in x and z is zero and I have y, we have y equals six. And then finally, if I plug in x and y being zero, then I get z equals three. This is probably the easiest way to draw a plane. So we find the points on the corresponding axes here, and then we just connect them in together into this kind of triangular plane right here. So this is going to be this is going to be our surface. And remember, this is only in the first octet. We only care about this in the, in the first octet here. All right. So now let's say, all right, so let's let's multiply all this out. I'm going to move the three abs to the front because it's a constant. So I have y squared plus 2y times 3, so it's 6y, um, minus 2xy. And then this, the 2s will cancel, and then we'll have minus y squared. Oh, that's pretty nice, because then those cancel. All right, now I think I'll do this. Uh, let's, do, let's do dy dx here. OK. So let's see here. If we're doing y, let's see which line we go out to in the y direction. Does anyone know what the equation of this line is right here? The furthest we go out in the y direction? What's the equation of this line? Yeah, it's gonna be six minus two x. And where did that come from? Uh, since this line lies in the xy plane, which is z equals zero, we just put z equals zero in here. And then we just subtract two X over. So this line has the equation Y equals six minus two X right here. So that will be our upper bound for Y. And then our lower bound for Y is this back here, which is just Y equals zero. And then we write the range of our X values. If we recall earlier, this was X equals three and we're in the first octant. So we go all the way to X equals zero right here. So here we go. So here's going to be our double integral right here. 
All right, so our D is the X, Y plane here, right? That's right. So the, the, the place that the parameters live in are going to be the X, Y plane. The place where the surface is, is this right here. So what we did is we changed the integral from being on this triangular thing, this triangular surface, to being on this flat triangle in the X, Y plane. Because off the top of our heads, we don't know how to do an integral on top of this, but we can do a double integral on top of this flat triangle down here. All right. It feels like all these lectures are different flavors of the same two concepts. You're onto something there. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're onto something there. We'll, we'll, we'll see how all this ties together at the end. All right, so let's go ahead and do this now. So now we just have an ordinary double integral. So um, let's see here. Um, I'm, well, I'm gonna factor out a, a two Y from all of this. Yeah, that might make things a bit better. So if I pull the two all the way out, I can cancel with that. And then I end up with Y um, times three minus X. Okay, this is probably the easiest way uh, to do this integral right here. All right, so let's go ahead and do the Y part. So this will be y squared over two, and then we have the three minus x. All righty. So let's see here. I'm gonna plug in my six minus two x in here. And I have three minus x, and then I have this over two. Okay. So we could foil all of this out and do a polynomial integral, and that wouldn't be too bad, uh, but there's actually a better way of doing this. So notice that there's a relationship between this and this. This is just two times what this is. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna pull a two out of here. That two will be squared, making it a four. I'm gonna divide by two, making it a two, and then I'm gonna multiply by three. So this is the same as six times the integral of three minus X cubed right here. If we do some algebra gymnastics. And now what we're going to do is we're going to spit out a negative sign. So this is negative six times the integral from zero to three of X minus three cubed DX right here. All right, and then now we could integrate this as a polynomial. So we have X minus three to the fourth over four from zero to three right here. Let's see, if I plug three into this, I'm gonna get zero for my first term. And if I plug zero in here, I'm going to get negative three to the fourth, but then since I'm subtracting my second term, that negative will go away. So I'm gonna have six times three to the fourth over four. Uh, let's see. I could simplify this a bit. So this is three times three to the fourth over two. So this is three to the fifth. So we have 243 over two. There we go. So just kind of like how um, double integrals originally were, uh, once you get everything set up, remember I only set up things in like the first two lines right here, then the rest of it is just kind of a grind to get through, unfortunately. So that's kind, of the, that's kind of the theme of this class is once you set everything up, that's the conceptually hard part, then it just takes a long time to, to grind through all the integral here. Uh, yeah, what's up? There will be a good amount of those. Yeah, we're definitely not gonna make you do like 15 full surface integrals or something. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so there, there will be a good amount of set of questions. All right, let's move on here. So let's talk about the orientation of a surface. So when we were doing line integrals, we talked about the orientation of the curve, right? So we had our, like for example, we said that a curve revolves around in a specific direction. And depending on the domain it enclosed, we said it was positively oriented or in other instances, if it goes the other way, we would say it's negatively oriented. So it turns out that many surfaces can be oriented as well, just like curves can be. Um, so the way we're going to define the orientation of a surface 
is we're going to use its normal vectors. So we're gonna, so if we have a surface here, like let's say we can have a blob S, so this is 2D, we have the normal vectors kind of popping out of it, right? So this would be the normal vector right here. And what we do is we define the normal vector in one direction to be positive. So maybe we call this one the positive one. And then the normal vector in the other direction is going to be negative right here. Oh, oops, these, sh these should be hats. We don't want to change the size of anything. We just want to talk about the direction here. So we would define one direction or one normal vector to be positive and one normal vector to be negative. And how do we do this? It depends on the context of the problem. So some problems will just give you an orientation, or maybe if you're doing physics or something like that, uh, there will be kind of a natural way to do it based on the context of your problem. All right, now how do we get a, a unit normal vector? Well, remember that this is a normal vector, RU cross RV. So of course, in order to make it uh, a unit vector right here, we're dividing by its magnitude. here. So this is our unit normal vector. Okay, so that, that's for an arbitrary surface. So that's if we just have some wiggly kind of surface floating there in space. Now, let's say we have a surface that's enclosing something. Like for example, a sphere is a surface that's enclosing the ball inside. And that's, that's what's known as a closed surface. If you're enclosing some amount of volume within whatever the surface is. So a sphere would be a good example right here. All right, so when we have a closed surface, uh, we say that S has a positive orientation if we choose the unit normal vector pointing outward from the solid. So if our normal vectors look like this, then we say our surface is positively oriented. And of course, if all these normal vectors were pointing within, like in towards the surface, that'd be considered uh, negative oriented. Okay, and then like I was saying earlier, for a surface which is not closed, like kind of just some kind of generic blob of a surface like this, um, it, it's, it's specified in the problem or it's specified by context. Um, now, not every surface can be assigned an orientation. So I'm sure many of you have probably seen this before. This is what's called a Mobius strip or a, a one-sided surface. So suppose, like, what, 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 so this is an example of a non-orientable surface right here. So let's see why. Why can't we define an orientation? Well, let's say we define this direction to be the positive orientation. Like, like I was saying earlier, if it's not a closed surface and this doesn't enclose a volume, uh, then we just define which way positive is. So let's define positive to be pointing outwards like this way. All right, so if we define this pointing outwards like this, and then we keep moving along the surface, then this is gonna be positively oriented. This is gonna be positively oriented. This will be positively oriented. But notice that this begins to kind of twist around. So if we stay on the same side, then we're gonna say that this is positively oriented and so is this and all of these right here once we go through with the little twist. But the problem is, is that once we come back around here, we could draw an arrow going in exactly the opposite direction of our original arrow. And supposedly, if we're consistent with how we did things, that should be positive too. But that doesn't really make sense. We want the opposite direction of our positively oriented vector to be negative right here. So that's why this ends up being non-orientable. So it's a bit difficult to define a surface integral over a non-orientable surface. All right. Okay, so all of that, um, all of that was talking about, um, all, all we talked about so far have been about scalar surface integrals, kind of like how we learned about scalar line integrals to begin with. Now what we're going to do is we're going to learn about the other flavor of surface integrals, which are vector surface integrals, or the surface integral of a vector field right here. Now this one has a bit more of an obvious interpretation. So this one I can probably give you a, a more satisfactory look into what we're computing here. Um, so one of the principal applications involving the vector form of surface integral relates to what's called the flux integral. It's the rate at which the gas passes through the membrane S if F is the velocity field of the gas movement. So let's say, for example, we have a vector field and we have, actually, this is easier to imagine with a closed surface. So let's say we have a sphere, right? So here's our sphere. It, it, it's right here. 
And let's say we have our vector field. So maybe some of the vectors on the surface are pointing outwards, but then some of them maybe are pointing tangent to the, the sphere, and then some of them are pointing inside the sphere. So this is a few, a few vectors from our vector field right here. What we're going to compute is roughly how much the vectors are pointing outwards. So for example, when we're computing our surface integral or our flux integral in this case, uh, this would contribute positively because it's going in the same direction that our normal, normal vector is. This would contribute positively. This would contribute zero because it's going just along the surface. So it's not really going in or out. It's just kind of staying there. So it's gonna be zero. And then these vectors would contribute negatively because these are going inside the surface right here. So what the flux interval is computing is roughly how much our vectors are pointing out of our surface here. And this has to do with a lot to do with uh, electricity and magnetism. Because for example, if you have a sphere here and you have some kind of electron in the middle, is the electric field gonna be pointing outwards or is it gonna be pointing inwards? So you can make computations uh, using flux integrals uh, to figure out things like that. All right, so that's, that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to figure out which way the vector field is pointing overall relative to the surface here. All right, now, how are we going to specifically do this? Well, why don't we try to use the scalar projection? Because that tells us how much F is going in the direction of N here, which is our positively oriented normal vector. Um, so the scalar projection here will be the magnitude of F times cosine of theta, where theta is the angle between N and F right here. All right, now cosine of theta, another way of writing it besides using theta is we could write it as the dot product of F and N divided by the magnitude of F times the magnitude of N half. Okay, now there's actually, this is gonna simplify a bit. So we have magnitude of F over magnitude of F, those will cancel. And then the magnitude of N hat, the magnitude of anything hat, so the magnitude of any unit vector will be one right here. So this is one, all these canceled. So we're really just computing F dot N hat. And this makes sense, right? Based on what we wanna do, if F is going in the same direction as N hat, if two vectors are parallel, then the dot product will be positive. If two vectors are perpendicular, kind of like what was happening with this right here, then it'll be zero. And then if two vectors are going in opposite directions, then F dot that vector will be negative. So this is doing exactly what we wanted it to do based on this setup right here. All right, now this is the rate at which the gas is going through here. So what we do is we multiply the rate that the gas is going through by the area in which it's going through right here. So this is gonna be F dot N dS right here. All right, let's see. I wanna make sure I write this out correctly. Here we go. All right, so overall, so what we're going to do is we're going to add up our tiny little pieces together. So this was just for one tiny little uh, chunk of the surface here. So like we've always seen with integrals, when we uh, throw together all of the tiny little chunks that we get the whole integral. So this is going to be the surface integral of F dot N hat dS right here. And remember, the way to interpret this is it's a measure of how much the vector field points out of the surface. We gain positive value if it does point out, we gain no value if it points perpendicular, and we gain negative value if it actually points inward instead. All right. And then one, one way you'll see this written instead of f dot n ds is the N and the DS will sort of be combined into this D and then S will be written as a vector right here. Uh, what is DS? DS is the area of this tiny little rectangle right here. So that, that's what that is. Okay. Let's see here. 
So, and then this is just kind of saying the same thing that I just said. So uh, the surface integral of F over S is defined to be this right here. And this is also called the flux integral of F across S. Okay, now this right here is not the way in which we're going to do these integrals right here. So kind of like how we didn't do integrals in the form f dot dr with line integrals, we changed them to look like something else. The same is going to happen right here. The arrow has the, yeah, you answered the question. That's right. All right. So what we're going to do here is we're going to write out uh, what this is. So we said that this was equal to this, right? All right, um, now a way of writing n hat, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change this to D. I'm gonna parameterize this surface and the normal vector will be RU cross RV divided by the magnitude of RU cross RV. Okay, so this right here, this is what n hat is. Now DS, remember we could write DS in a different way as well. We have RU cross RV DA. Remember, that's what DS is. And you can think of this as like the Jacobian for S. But that's actually pretty convenient because that and that will cancel out. So the way we actually do an integral that looks like this is we turn it into this right here. So we find a parameterization of our surface. We compute what this is, do a dot product, and then do that integral. And then just like before, if we have an explicit parameterization of our surface, z is an actual function of x and y, then we could write this more specifically. So this is gonna end up being f dot negative kx, negative ky, and one dA. So this is if we have a surface that's defined as a function of x and y right here. Is this related to the volume of a parallel pipe ed? Hmm. Mm, F R U cross V. Oh yeah, I actually yeah, I, I I think it is related to that. That's right. Yeah, because this this kind of gives you the the parallelogram, and then dotting this gives you the vertical height of the parallel pipe. Ed. Yeah, that, that that's that's very good. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Let's see, we have enough time to do this. Uh, I might go over a few minutes, but I think we should do this one. Evaluate the flux integral, uh, the double integral of f dot dn, if f is the vector field y, x, z squared. So if we were to draw this vector field, we would draw a bunch of arrows floating in space, right? Then what we're going to do is we're going to look at this surface right here. And looking at this surface, I think this is gonna end up being, um, what would this end up being? Well, I'm not sure, but it's gonna be some kind of surface here. And we're seeing how much this vector field is pointing through this surface right here. All right. So let's see here. So let's go ahead and compute this. So our surface integral of F dot DS, the way we're actually going to do this is we're going to do F dot RU cross RV uh, DA. All right, so let's see. We need to figure out what RU and RV are. What's RU? It's cosine of V, sine of V, and zero. RV is negative U sine of V, U cosine of V, and one. All right, and then if we do the cross product here, I'll save some time and skip the computation for that. I think you guys can do a cross product. We end up with sine of V, negative cosine of V, and U as our RU cross RV. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to take our vector field right here, and we're going to write it in terms of our parameterization. So the first coordinate's just supposed to be Y, right? But if this is our x, y, and z, I'm gonna write y as u sine of v. Next, I'm supposed to write x for the second coordinate, but my parameterization for x is u cosine of v. 
And then I'm supposed to write Z squared for my final component, but Z is V. So this is going to be V squared. And then I dot this with my R U cross R. Sine of V, negative cosine of V, and U. And I guess I'll do this uh, DU DV here. So U goes from zero to one. They say that right here. And then V goes from zero to two pi. All right, so let's do this dot product. And remember, this was the original F, and then this is R U cross R V. All right, so we dot here, we have U sine squared of V, and then we have minus U cosine squared of V, and then we have U V squared right here. All right, it seems like I could factor out a U from all of this. So I have sine squared of V minus cosine squared of V um, plus V squared. And then, oops, and then I multiply by the integral from zero to one of just u because I'm factoring a u out of all of this. And then I have what's left over for my v's right here. All right. So now, ordinarily, cosine squared minus sine squared would be cosine of 2v with a double angle formula. But if we're going the other way, this will just be negative cosine of 2v. So that's what, that's what this is going to be. Uh, right here. All right, so then we can go ahead and integrate everything. The integral of negative cosine of 2v will be negative sine of 2v over 2. Uh, the integral of v squared will be v cubed over 3 from 0 to 2 pi. And then the integral of u is u squared over 2 from 0 to 1. All right, we plug in 2 pi and 0 in here, we get 0. We plug 2 pi into here, and we get uh, eight pi cubed over three. And then we plug one into here and get one half. So all in total, we end up with four pi cubed over three right here. Okay, so what does this answer signify? Remember this answer is a measure of how much this vector field is pointing out of the surface. So since we ended up getting a positive answer, this means that usually the vectors are pointing in what we define to be the positive direction, at least more so than they were in the negative direction right here. So that's what this answer signifies right here. Um, oh man, we didn't get to number nine here, but we definitely don't have enough time. All right, we will finish this lesson next time and then maybe we'll be able to begin uh, start of 33. Don't worry, a lot of this will become clear once we get to the final lesson, the, the season finale of, of Calc 3 here. We'll be able to tie all of this together uh, neatly. I will see you guys on Monday.